OpenAI just released their latest flagship model, O1. It is September 12th, 2024, and they just released it today. I learned about it while I was at work, and I was reading about it on my break at work, and it seems to me, from everything that I've read and the videos they've posted to their website, that it has a unprecedented ability to reason for a model of its kind. I'm not entirely sure how it does that, but apparently it takes its time and thinks about problems before it actually answers them. One of the lines that really excited me was when it said, in our tests, the next model update performs similarly to PhD students on challenging benchmark tasks in physics, chemistry, and biology. We also found that it excels in math and coding. In a qualifying exam for the International Mathematics Olympiad, GPT-4.0, the previous flagship model, correctly only solved 13% of problems, while the reasoning model scored 83%. And they go on and on about how great it is, and they even have these videos of different professionals in like genetics and like uh, economics. I think they have someone in quantum physics, there's cognition. They have all these different domain experts saying how this O1 model has benefited them. And so I had a bit of an idea. Apparently it's so great. It's a PhD level, you know, PhD student level of cognition ability on physics and math and whatever. So I was like, okay, why don't you take on the most infamous physics textbook that any physics graduate has ever experienced. And that is Classical Electrodynamics by John David Jackson. Anyone who has studied physics at an advanced level, either for their master's or their PhD, has heard about this legendary book because this book is infamous. The problems are hard, the material is not very explanatory, kind of assumes you just know everything. And uh, it's, it's pretty much a meme at this point in the physics community. And even so much so that there's this famous document, famous in the physics realm, uh, that's called Everything I Needed to Know in Life I Learned from Jackson Electrodynamics. So there's, it's just a funny post that talks about lessons and realizations. And I love number eight, which talks about how one Jackson problem takes an average of one and a half weeks to finish and gives you a breakdown of just how solving a Jackson problem goes. And so I want to challenge O1. I want to see how it does against Jackson if it's so smart. And I haven't used it yet because I wanted to use it for this video and see how it would perform on some problems from this infamous legendary textbook. Okay, so I picked out three problems from Jackson, three different problems, and they were all just like mostly the first part. And these are all problems that the answer is known because I want to be able to assess, did it get it right? So I won't be able to maybe break down every line. I haven't done Jackson Electrodynamics myself in years, but I wanted to see, can it get the correct answer for these three problems that the answer is actually known? You can just derive you know, all the math to get to this point. So I really wanted to know and I wanted to find out and you're gonna find out with me. So let's begin. I picked out three problems from the beginning, middle and end chapters of Jackson. So it kind of spans a range of difficulty in my opinion. So the first problem is I think from chapter two or from chapter three. It says here, two halves of a long hollow uh, conducting cylinder of inner radius B are separated by small lengthwise gaps on each side and are kept at different potentials V1 and V2. Show that the potential inside is given by this expression and so forth. So, okay, we are gonna give it this problem and you can't give it images. That's why I actually had to type this thing all out. So I am just gonna go ahead and copy this. I'm not gonna tell it anything else but this problem. And we're gonna go see how it does. I'm very curious to see if it will derive this. So we're just gonna paste that in there. That LaTeX looks good. Hopefully it can understand that. And uh, away we go. Let's see. It's thinking. All right, let's see how well you think. Setting up the problem, okay. Mapping solutions, reflecting on symmetry, analyzing boundary conditions. All right, all sounds good to me. It's considering a Fourier series. Okay. Deriving average and coefficients. Breaking down the intervals. Wow, this is, this is pretty in depth. Calculating B N coefficients, uh-oh. I don't know about this. This seems maybe like 
Connecting series to functions? Oh, wow. Is it, is it actually doing it? I can't tell. Like, is it actually getting it? I can't wait for it to... Un oh, it's changing my approach. Oh, it looks like it didn't get it. Oh, it doesn't... It, I think it got it wrong the first time. So it's backtracking here. This is interesting. So it may have made a mistake the first time, but it's sort of double backed. Okay. Confirming a standard identity. I really want to see this, this process. Oh, oh my gosh. It's, oh wow. I am looking at the process. Oh, oh wow. We can actually see all that. So what happened here? Wow. <laughs> I don't think it got it. I think it's, 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 it's kind of doing the grad student thing. You kind of like it, you, <laughs> it's following this, right? Like you figure out like in day one and two, why is it not working? Where are the fa missing factors in two? It <laughs> uh oh, chat GPT. It looks like you got some work to do. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, <gasps> what? No way. Oh my goodness. It looks like it got it. We have derived the potential inside the cylinder as this. So let's see here. Oh my goodness. It, how did it do it? Okay. Oh, it thought for two minutes, two minutes. I mean, the average Jackson problem <laughs> for a human is one and a half weeks. So one and a half weeks and it was done in 122 uh, seconds. So, wow. Um, physics grad students, we can start crying now. That's uh, that's an exponential speed up if I ever saw it. Um, let's take a look at its process here. It, it obviously tried multiple ways of doing it. And I just want to see if it has an approach that would look anything like I would have attempted it. So first things first, you got to set up Laplace's equation cylindrical. It makes sense because the potential has to satisfy the Laplace equation. Okay. So it's using it in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, okay. Separation of variables. That's standard. You got to solve the angular part and the radial part. Right. Okay, so yeah, because you're assuming it's a product. Um, oh, wow, it knew to get rid of this term because it would blow up at the origin. Wow, okay. Applies the boundary conditions. And does a Fourier series. How would you just know that? <laughs> I would not know this. X to the n over n sine n phi is equal to this. I would never have gotten that, but... Let's just pretend I would have gotten that. Uh, and we uh, use this identity and wow. Okay, I mean, it's just the first problem. It's just the first problem. That was the easy one. That was the easy one, okay? That was the easy one. Um, good, you got the first one, all right? So let's, let's see now. Let's see how it will do on problem number two, okay? Problem two, again, it's midway through the book. We're moved on to like the magnetism chapter now. Uh, and so perhaps this one will be a little bit more of a challenge for it. So let's copy that and uh, let's let's pop that in here and bang. All right, off to the races. Let's say let's see how it does here. Breaking down the mutual inductance, starting by driving the mutual inductance involves expressing complete elliptic integrals. Okay. Wow. I like how it's able to sort of backtrack when it, you know, finds an approach that, oh my goodness, it just did it. Wait, what? Holy moly, wait a minute. Expression, unstanding mutual. Okay, case 1D, da -da -da, da -da -da. Oh my gosh. Trend of case. Summary, mutual coaxial loops is this. Answer, an explicit expression is this with k squared simplifies to what? I don't know if that's right or not, but it got that first part right. What? That's insane. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Where was this when I was in grad school? <laughs> All the grad students who are coming after me. You guys, you don't know how good you have it now, especially 21 seconds. It did it in 21 seconds. Oh my goodness. 21 seconds. That is, that is ridiculous. Oh my. Okay. So again, I'm not, I'm not being the professor in grading this, but just 
from glancing at the fact that it got to this part at the end here, which is the uh, correct answer. According to Jackson, you know, we're, we're, we're taking Jackson's word for this. Uh, it sounds like it got it right. So, okay. Um, the last challenge uh, is the third problem, and it's a two-parter, right? It's a part A and a part B. So maybe this is where it gets stopped. This is from, like, chapter 10, deep within the bowels of this book. It's all the way back, like, here, okay? This is where things just get really ridiculous. So maybe, maybe... It will meet its match in this problem but honestly after what it's shown me so far i am not so sure anymore i, I thought honestly i was like ah this thing's probably gonna get stopped right here but on the first or second problem but oh no oh no 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 but we're gonna give it the two-parter let's see if it can reason through this uh efficiently so here we go oh that's a that looks like very messy to me but uh nevertheless we're just going to go. All right. Here we go. Thinking. Let's see its thought process here. Test with deriving two expressions for the scattering cross section per scatterer, scatterer modeled as right circular cylinders. Okay. It's thinking. What do you mean you're thinking? How are you thinking? Tell me, machine. How, how do you think? How is it possible that you're thinking? You're thinking about the differential scattering cross-section, how polarization factors might alter this for electromagnetic waves. I'm digging in. Why is it saying I'm digging in? That's like such a human thing to say. I'm digging into this. What kind of human talks like this? Not human, sorry. What kind of machine model talks like this? Machine learning model. I'm getting all flustered here. The bezel functions. Okay, yeah. We are doing bezel function work. Working through the integral of this. Simplifying to that. Working through the differential cross-section. I'm rethinking. How are you rethinking? How do you do it? How are you storing this knowledge and like going back and forth in your, your head or your brain? I don't know. Why am I anthropomorphizing you? It's almost too easy. I'm piecing together. What is it? The, rela the relationship to angles between vectors and unit vectors is becoming clearer. It's like I've seen the light. Like, yes, I've mapped out the solution now. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's what you needed to do. Did you actually do it? So it just reiterated to me what it had to do. Uh, let's see here. Applies the first born approximation. Okay. Compute scattering amplitude. Volume integral becomes that. It's even great over the azimuthal angle. Integrate over the radial angle. Okay. Oh my gosh. I like to pretend that I, I know what's going on here, but... You know, it lost me a while ago. What? Oh! It got it! Oh my gosh! It got the first part. Did it get the second part? Okay. You can approximate this because of the, the bezel function behavior in the, in the limit that Ka is less than 1. On the averages, da, 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 do an integral, change the variable, integral becomes that. Uh huh, uh huh, simplify. And but do we can approximate first of all, we supply the expression. Wait, we can supply that. Oh my goodness, we have successfully derived. Oh my gosh. Um, I need a sip of water really quickly. Well, um, it just did that. It uh, just sliced through those three Jackson problems. Um, kind of like it was not really a huge deal. I mean, it did it in like a combined total of less than five minutes, three problems in like five minutes when, you know, grad students have been struggling to t finish one problem in like a, 10 days. Um, okay, I believe your report now, um, OpenAI. <laughs> I believe it, okay, I believe it. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't uh, doubt 
its, I don't want to say intelligence, but its ability to solve these kinds of problems now, because I'm honestly really shocked. So what are my big picture thoughts on this? First of all, I want to say I'm still in a little bit of shock after seeing the results of this session. I mean, how can I argue with what I just did? I, I mean, it's... Uh, Perhaps maybe I could have given it a more open-ended problem, one that it did not actually have the answer to, to sort of shoot for, but then I wouldn't be able to evaluate its accuracy without doing the problem myself. So uh, nevertheless, it was honestly phenomenal, I think, in its explanations and just showing all of its steps. And I think if you were a professor or someone grading a student's work and they turned something like this in, I think you would be very pleased to see that kind of effort, at least if I was the grader. And so I, I'm i not going to doubt OpenAI's claim that it has that sort of PhD level, PhD student level ability to solve and reason through these kinds of complex problems. What it means moving forward, I don't know. I mean, I think it's very exciting that more people are going to have access to a tool of this kind of capability. I think it's going to be an awesome study partner. I mean, I wish I had this in like the 20 plus years I was in school. It, this would have been just such an accelerant to my education. And uh, I I also concede the argument, though, that this this could just be the ultimate cheating device, right, to, to students. And so in some ways, I'm kind of happy I didn't have this in school because I guess then I would assume everyone's just going to be using it. I mean, I don't know how universities and high schools are going to prevent this. Uh, I'm, I, I'm very curious to know how they are because it's obviously going to wipe the floor with anything, <laughs> maybe like a high school you know, exam or homework assignment uh, can give. And so in terms of bigger picture, I also think that professions are definitely going to get improved and we will definitely become more efficient with these tools and that perhaps we'll make more discoveries and innovations. I know the big thing about AI these days is that people haven't really seen the monetary benefits of what it's been proclaimed to be able to do. Uh, there's been a lot of investment and in like venture capital and stuff like that and all these different uh, AI startups, but there hasn't really been a, a noticeable return on the investments yet. But I don't know. I, I, I can't see how this won't lead to some, I don't know, revolutionary change in the way we go about our, at least our daily boring tasks we have to do if we do like an office job, right? Um, but even in fields like computer vision, right? Like with autonomous driving cars and robotics, I mean, think about the tasks those things would be able to do if it had this kind of reasoning ability out in the real world. Um, and it can be scary. I mean, we always have to consider the negative aspects of any tool that is developed, a tool especially this powerful. I mean, you can imagine just how someone could use this O1 model to uh, give a very detailed blueprint to do something very bad, right? I'm not going to get specific with that, but you can imagine. And so... I'm excited to have it and use it. I think it would be great to get my hands on it uh, when it's it's actually fully uh, operational, which is also the scariest bit, that this was the preview. Like, this was the preview of O1. This wasn't even the full model, and it mopped the floor with these Jackson problems. And so it's, it's uh, a very exciting time to be alive, for sure. It can also be a very scary time. But I think that whether we like it or not, we're going to have to get used to these things being around us more. And in my opinion, it would do as well if we all get a little bit more comfortable using these things because they're going to be with us. So anyways, I think I've talked enough. I think I got the point across that this shocked me. This absolutely surprised me. I did not believe that it could do Jack's electrodynamics in five minutes. Uh, but it did. And so thank you for watching. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, come back to my channel for next time. And uh, I will see you all later.